So I've been a specialist in myeloma for very many years. I spent 10 years at the NZI. I was the chief for the Sloan Kettering program in New York for almost seven years. And I've been here in Miami for about two years at the current time. Uh, it takes a lot of time to build up research programs. The way I look at the field right now, where the big gaps are, I think one big gap I do see is when is the optimal time to start therapy? Where is the intersection between precursor disease and multiple myeloma? I think the definition for what my, multiple myeloma is, is still a little bit outdated. I think we have generated research data in our lab and other groups as well, showing that you can identify the disease genomically one or two years before the symptoms happen. And I think there's more work that needs to be done. I'm also the co PI for the Icelandic screening study with Dr. Kristinsson in Iceland. Uh, and we published very recently screening effort showing that half percent of the general population actually has smoldering myeloma with that, that definition. I think in that group, if we could identify who is going to progress to multiple myeloma, to intervene early, that would be important. So work on the genomic and other determinants for progression is a very important area to identify the disease and treat it because that's probably where we have the best chance to deliver good therapy if you want to seek a cure. I think other areas that we are working on uh, are around uh, the so-called high-risk uh, disease. And I mentioned, uh, I've discussed with many people on the importance of upgrading the terminology for what high risk is. It used to be 15 years ago that you did fission cytogenetics, you gave the same drugs to every patient and the ones that didn't do as well, those were put in the high risk buckets and then looking at fission cytogenetics, what they had in common, that's the list for what high risk is. But the therapies are so much better these days. So if you do the same 100 patients with new modern therapy, most of them will do equally very well. And there are still, unfortunately, some patients that don't do as well, but they may be only 10%. Instead of 30%, it's 10%. So those 10% are different. And trying to understand the biology of those individuals and how to address the intervention strategies there, what therapies should we give to these patients, because they are different. That's a big task for the field. So redefining the biology for high risk, the identification of high risk and doing intervention. And we just were awarded a big grant for this, and we are going to have a large focus uh, on this uh, in the future. That's a very big, important priority area for us. And I would refer to this as precision medicine. That's a huge effort that we are now going forward uh, in, in that direction. There are a lot of other related areas uh, when it comes to say tracking of the disease with minimal residual disease. I worked on that for over 15 years. We worked in the bone marrow. We worked with targeted imaging. We do work on that as well. We also work in blood-based technologies. I think that uh, tracking of minimal residual disease and using that for treatment decision-making is going to change the whole field. I do think blood-based technologies eventually will become the way but we cannot rush to where we want to be. We have to do all the different steps. We cannot skip uh, second, third, fourth, fifth grade and go right from first to sixth grade. We have to do all the grades. So we, when we come to sixth grade, that we, we deliver and then keep on going seven, eight, and so forth. So we have to do all the work to get to where we need to be. And we are working very much. We are setting up mass spec-based technologies we have clonotypic characterization. We can actually find peptides in the blood, proteins, that link back to the genomics. So we are tying both genomic and proteins together. And that means also that we can see both the disease and if there are subclones of the disease, and maybe this will also impact how we will treat the disease if, disease if it comes back again. So we're going to keep on working a lot on MRD assays. Uh, and also, Lastly, I'll talk about the role of all the immunotherapies. So we are now working, like all the other teams, on antibodies. We're working on CAR T cells, but we're also working with the latest technologies. So we are working on, can you insert, uh, can you insert genetic code in the human body and have the body making their own antibodies? Uh, we will open that in, in this year. We will be one out of very few sites in America to do that and in the world. Uh, and we think that you can probably synthesize your own antibodies in your own body. And we think that you can use 
advanced technology is probably to have multiple of these being synthesized in the body. So I think the whole field of immunotherapy is very important. Uh, and we work across different diseases also at our cancer center. Uh, and we are learning that the immune system and the tumor uh, cells are interacting very much. We, we have papers coming out this year where we, we show how, how these interactions really impact clinical outcome. We are just in the beginning of this, but I think that's where, where the field is heading overall.